the hardest challenge that we've got isn't so much the size of the streets, but our efficiency in use of them. That when we have individuals, uh, you know, one person is taking up all of this room in a metal cage of a car or uh, a truck, sometimes trucks that are commercial sized even, um, that's just a lot less room to move people. And it's a lot more opportunities for accidents with, that can be really quite serious. Welcome to this WGBH News Forum produced by GBH Forum Network, GBH News and Transportation for Massachusetts. I'm Bob C., GBH News Transportation Reporter, and I've had the pleasure of moderating this series of four webinars about the future of mass mobility. It's been titled Next Stop, and tonight is our last stop. We'll be discussing how to improve transportation access for people with disabilities. For people with disabilities and for our aging population, access is a deal maker. And while Americans with Disability Act has been the law for decades, the MBTA and other transit agencies are making slow progress towards providing full accessibility. How is the MBTA prioritizing accessibility improvements and what are the partnerships that are necessary to success? In addition, the advent of e-bikes has made cycling more accessible and convenient for many more people than conventional bikes, but is needed for e-bikes to realize their potential and to encourage widespread adoption. Now, before presenting our panelists, I would like to give the mic over to Josh Ostroff, who's Interim Director of Transportation for Massachusetts, who has been our active partner on producing this series. Josh. Thank you so much, Bob, and thank you to your team at WGBH Forum, and a special thanks to our panelists tonight. Transportation for Massachusetts is a statewide advocacy coalition that seeks to make transportation in Massachusetts more equitable and just, more sustainable and clean, and more attainable for everybody. And this topic that we're talking about tonight is really central to our mission. We believe that transportation needs to serve us all, whatever our ability whatever our region, whatever our preferred mode is, and to make that happen is going to require a lot of work um, and, uh, and a lot of information. And I am indebted to our panelists and to you for helping to get some more information and dialogue out there, just so people understand the challenges that we all face and some of the solutions that are on the horizon and many that are being implemented already, thanks to the good work of many transit agencies and advocates. Back to you, Bob, and thank you. Thank you, Josh. And tonight, uh, we have the pleasure of being joined by Laura Burlesford, who's the Assistant General Manager, System-Wide Accessibility for the MBTA. We have Reggie Ramos, Director of Inclusive Public Transit at the Institute for Human-Centered Design, and Sarah Dillon Brewer, uh, co-host of Bike Talk on KPFK Radio. And even though that's in California, she's with us here in Boston. So welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to have you all with us. I'd like to start with you, Reggie. Can you give us an idea of when we say disabilities, what we may mean or what we may not understand? So Bob, um, when you speak of disabilities, especially in the context of public transit, let's start with numbers and how this is impacted, right? Um, who are we specifically talking about and how many people? So for instance, um, when we speak of disabilities as it affects um, uh, access to public transit, in Massachusetts, there are about 26.5% of adults aged 18 and above who have a disability. 
and that doubles when when the adults reach 65 and over. And um, when we speak of the ADA as a translate to public transportation, we really are speaking of while it carries um, you know, programmatic and infrastructure requirements, it is very much centered on wheelchair accessibility. Let's look at the numbers for that. Um, in Massachusetts, as I said, there's 26.5% of adults who have a disability, but only 1.4% of that use wheelchairs. In the United States, about 3.6 million people with disabilities use a wheelchair but about 10 times the number of that at 30.6 million have difficulty in walking or climbing stairs, but do not use wheelchairs. So what I'm trying to say in other words, Bob, is that there's a larger or a, a larger number of people with disabilities who while not using wheelchairs might be unaccounted for in the design of public transit. Um, and ironically though, unintentionally, they're the ones that are that, that, that really remain within the fringes of the conversation. And so uh, the challenge really is to kind of open up what does disability mean? How many people are affected? And when we speak of disability, do we encumber ourselves with a definition that it only refers to the impairment, to an impairment that substantially limits uh, a major life activity? Or are we now saying that it can be an umbrella term like the World Health Organization um, defines disability to include impairments, activity limitation, and participatory restrictions. And, and these all um, intersect in, in, the, in the conversation of public transit and providing it and having, a, a, you know, providing everyone with access to it. Well Well, thank you so much, Reggie, especially when it comes to transit. And um, with regard to, to, to transit, we one of the numbers we also don't know is how many people would use transit if they could, uh, right? I mean, we really, that's a really hard thing to document, but consider the difficulty that, that somebody has to go through to say, take the T. So Laura, you're with us tonight, Laura Brelsford from the MBTA. And uh, we were talking before about a landmark court decision that was made here in Massachusetts that really affected uh, how the MBTA has to deal with this issue. So tell us about that and what its implications are. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think over the last, last two decades, the MBTA has really fundamentally changed the way, uh, the way it thinks and approaches the issue of accessibility and uh, inclusive design. And uh, it's no exaggeration to say that that would not have been the case, but for a class action lawsuit that was brought uh, against the T in the early 2000s by a group of local writers with disabilities who said the MBTA services are simply not, not accessible for for all writers and that the T was not meeting its minimal obligations under a variety of state and federal laws related to accessibility. Um, so that lawsuit was actually filed in 2002, ultimately settled in 2006, which time the T entered into really the country's largest uh, settlement agreement related to accessible transportation. The team made over 200 commitments to um, completely changing the way it approached this issue. Um, so significant that in fact, we are still working through some of them 15, 14, 15 years later. So with that settlement, um, sort of a new era was, was uh, ushered in. Um, huge, huge um, requirements around uh, the way we think about bus operations, uh, the purchasing of new accessible vehicles, complete uh, complete re uh, <clears throat> re updates of our bus operator training, the way we monitor and hold staff accountable, 
um, huge investments into our network of elevators. We had one of the most unreliable systems when it comes to when it came to elevator uptime. Um, and today we have um, the country's most reliable elevator system of any of any major transit system. Um, and one of the most important aspects of the settlement agreement was the creation of a department, um, which I now work, that is focused exclusively on accessibility. Um, and that reports directly to the general manager. So when there are issues that arise or conflicts that arise um, or projects are delayed related to improvements, we're able to have those discussions um, at the highest levels of the organization. Um, so I think through that and through um, the relationships we've built with a number of our riders over the years, for the first time, the perspectives of people with disabilities are really baked in to the way the team makes decisions, whether it's renovating a station or creating a, an employee training, that accessibility is now, uh, now a consideration in all of those decisions. Well, it's it's quite a story. And of course, the, the, uh, the judge or, or the court checks in every six months to kind of hold people's feet to the fire and, and measure accountability. So it sounds from you like things have been successful. I mean, are they they're getting better or is it still very challenging to, to, to get what's needed? So I think the, the system is completely, um, completely unlike it was 15 years ago. I know I, I talk a lot about, I had actually just moved to, the Boston area in 2004, and I used a wheel my wheelchair myself. And uh, the issues I ran in, into related to the, the lack of accessibility at the T uh, made me almost turn directly around and, mm -hmm. and move back, move back home to Western Mass. Um, the system was largely un unusable. Elevators were out all the time. Bus operators would not, not, not uh, stop to board you. I mean, it was it was pretty bleak. Um, and today, that's that's simply not the case due to the investments that have been made. There are still a number of challenges for riders with disabilities, um, and we we have a long way to go until we can say we are a fully inclusive, accessible system. But but there's been there's been a lot lot of progress. Well, that's and that's it, really good to hear. I mean, thanks for that perspective, uh, kind of having us remember what it was like, and at least we are making some headway. And you say like the whole mindset at the MBTA is certainly different than it was back then. Um, I'd like to tur turn to our third panelist, Sarah. Hi. Or are you? Um, well, and uh, you do a show called Bike Talk, and. At a recent rally at the State House, I ran into some uh, older people who were, you know, praising e-bikes. It was an e-bike rally, mm -hmm. and uh, I realized what a transformational technology this could be for people in so many ways. So, why don't you talk about what the advent of, of e-bikes and will mean? Well. <clears throat> I had loved, loved, loved cycling as a kid, but um, my disability is degenerative and had already hit my knees by the time I was a young teenager. So I thought cycling was just not going to happen for me ever again. Um, but um, <clears throat> with e-bikes and especially with the advent of e-bikes that are at least somewhat affordable for consumers, it did, uh, it just literally opened up the sky to me. Um, I had gotten to a point when my disability affected my hands and I was no longer able to operate my mobility aids, including a manual wheelchair. And it takes so long to get a powered wheelchair. And even when you do, the range of a powered wheelchair and uh, its ability to deal with various weather conditions, curb heights, and so on, um, nowhere near what it is for an e-bike. So um, I was able to get a cargo e-bike and I uh, have been riding it year round, absolutely everywhere I go. Um, with public transit, um, 
even if all of the elevators are working, somehow I still have to be able to get to a bus stop to take a bus to the T. And I have to be able to stand long enough for that bus to arrive. And right there, that's inaccessible to me um, because my, my nearest stop um, has no bench, has no kind of weather shelter at all. Um, so it's something that, that we can work on to make the tea more accessible. But um, when it wasn't accessible, I was just stuck indoors at my home address. Um, and thank goodness during the pandemic, there, uh, there were a lot of people who were stuck at home too. Um, and so I was able to have some sense of community but it had been, uh, been about three years before that since I had really been able to just go from one place to another and just be able to notice the weather <laughs> and get a little sun. And e-bikes have really made uh, spaces that previously to me were exclusively able-bodied spaces, uh, at least for people who didn't have my disabilities. And they have made them accessible uh, right down to the state house. I would not have been able to speak at that state house rally for e-bikes. If I did not have an e-bike, there are so many stairs and cobblestones and other obstacles around that area. So it's given me access to the outdoors and to be a full citizen of this Commonwealth. Well, thanks Sarah, because you know we take that for granted you know, our ability mm. to move. And, uh, and, and I think you, you point out that when you don't have it is when you really, when you really feel it. Uh, Josh Ostroff, you've been standing by the Q&A box there. Do you have any questions you'd like to give us now? Thank you, Bob. So yeah, uh, one question that just came in through um, a Zoom, and we've gotten a couple of others in advance, are the MBTA's plans to add a redundancy um, elevators throughout the system? Um, that's, you know, occasionally elevators go out of service. So what are the plans for backup or, or, or maintenance in general? Um, I think that that would be something to start with. Yeah, that's a great question. So that, um, like I mentioned, related to the settlement, one of the drivers of the settlement agreement was, for the original lawsuit, was the frustration around elevator access. And um, I think there was a recognition that even when, even if and when the MBTA got to a place where elevators were generally being maintained in a reliable way, there were still gonna be periods of times where they go out of service, whether it's for maintenance or, or, um, or other unexpected reasons. And the really only good way to mitigate that is to build in redundancy. Um, either by constructing an additional elevator or another alternate accessible path. So a huge, huge um, chunk of um, <clears throat> resources initially went into constructing um, additional elevators at several major stations that already had some accessibility. Stations like Park Street, like Harvard Square, Porter Square, um, today we have a, a station design standard that calls for elevator redundancy to accessible paths, at least at every, every new or renovated station. Mm -hmm. We have just about 40 to 45 elevators currently under design right now. Um, this is one topic that we, we are really invested in. Um, I recently just looked at looked at um, all of our stations and and um, it looks like just about half of our stations um, have have redundancy of some sort so either two elevators or an accessible path which is which is really which is really fantastic um, so we're gonna keep we're gonna keep working to advance that um, to the extent that not only will uh, hopefully you know we get to the point where we have all of our stations be fully accessible, there'll also be a redundant accessible option for folks there as well. Anything else, Josh? Sure, um, thank you. So some questions about e-bikes have come in and I guess this would be uh, uh, more addressed to Dylan. Uh, 
what is the prospect for e-bike legislation that would make them more widely available um, you know, mm-hmm. throughout Massachusetts? Well, it just went up, um, which is a wonderful thing. Um, we've got um, a bill that, uh, that is being reported out of committee uh, after having been stuck there a long time, just doing the really basic business of classifying e-bikes as, an, as a thing, a vehicle that's distinct from motorcycles and distinct from bicycles, and also that establishes three classes of e-bikes according to what kind of engine it has um, and how much assistance it can give you, basically. Um, and that, once that's in place, will allow the state and municipalities to be able to talk about where e-bikes can and can't go on trails, for example, um, and, and we can be talking about speed limits for them and so on, uh, licensing for the more powerful ones. Um, and uh, I'm really excited uh, because e-bikes, although they're much, much more affordable than cars, um, are still pretty pricey. Um, so it's, it's wonderful that there's a bill um, to provide a rebate for consumers who can get one. And um, that's a marvelous thing because for every errand, for every trip, and certainly for every car owned, um, when there's a car that's not on the road and an e-bike is there instead, that's cleaner air, that's more parking for people, um, that's less traffic, it's, uh, it's really a win all the way around. Thank you, Sarah. You know, um, this sort of leads me into a question about design. And Reggie, uh, I'd like you to comment on this because what, how can design really improve the situation for people with disabilities regarding transit? So I, w- I wanna start uh, from the point of disability being a contextual barrier. Each one of us in our own lives, whether you know, um, we are going to experience some sort of functional limitation or participatory restrictions, arthritis, you know, sprain, all of these um, are disabilities within the context of uh, the World Health Organization definition, which really invites us to look at disability happening at the nexus of the individual and the environment, that interaction. Uh, for instance, and I think this is better um, relayed by an example, a person who might have a brain-based disability or a sensory disability, say um, anxiety disorder, may in the usual course of things traverse through public transit without, without issue. But given the many stimulus, sensory stimulus, sound, light, speed, um, it might be treacherous. So in that context, when we account for those people who have who live, whose li- daily life experience is within that context, and there's a huge majority of that, we now use this the concept of inclusive design that centers, that focuses on the human experience. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it takes into consideration the wide range or diverse set of users with the right, widest range of abilities as they interact with the different, the widest ranges of environments, right? And without having to employ a special design. So in a way, inclusive design really challenges us and radically alters how we design spaces and how we think about, you know, uh, you know, the power of design in, in, in sort of disarming the, transfor- the transformational ability of public transit. So, so really the design is a framework by which we can think of public transit policies, but also to design the hard infrastructure of, of public transit. And, you know, with so many users competing now for street space, uh, especially since the pandemic, we have more bike lanes, we have more bus lanes. There's not a standardized design for these things. And I think I've, I've told you that sometimes I, you know, driving along some of these roads, I'm somewhat sympathetic to motorists because it's visually very confusing. So is standardizing some of this design uh, desirable, but is it possible even? I think 
that it's desirable. Um, safety is often prompted by the predictability of design. But design only works when it thinks about the broadest spectrum. Design only persists and is made to endure, has, has durability, if it includes everybody in the design. And, and really, Bob, there is that conversation to be had about the intersectionality of the human context. A person with disability in belonging to a community of color has a totally different um, public transit experience. Um, a person with disability who is low income and belonging to a community of color has a totally different experience from one who isn't. So understanding the demographic and the complexity of the cultural usage of the public transit infrastructure is necessary in factoring and, and coming up with the design. And, and this is what we call really human-centered and, and, and focuses on the human experience, though no one's but universal. Okay. Um, I also wanted to uh, give Laura a chance to comment on one of the issues she raised, which was uh, emergency response mm. on the transit system for, for those who uh, are disabled. Tell us about that, Laura. Sure. So we were, we're talking a little bit earlier about um, sort of present challenges that we're trying to think through or areas where there, there's not a lot of regulatory guidance today. And one thing that comes to mind um, for me is, is the issue of emergency response as it relates to, to people with disabilities. Um, this is something that we've been giving a tremendous amount of thought over the last few years at the MBTA as we design stations and vehicles and think about emergency response plans. Uh, when it comes to building codes that are in place today, there are some pretty clear requirements around uh, emerg uh, emergency evacuation pathways, um, the speed at which passengers need to be able to get out of a station, um, but not a lot of guidance about, about those of us with disabilities. Um, and often the solutions that are prescribed are concepts like dedicated areas where you can wait um, until someone is able to provide you assistance, typically a first responder. So we've been really trying to think, think proactively about those issues and where possible build in pathways that allow all riders to, to get out of a dangerous situation independently to the greatest extent, extent possible. But this is definitely a, an area where there, there's just not been a lot of, a lot of regulatory thought Around around inclusive emergency preparedness. Okay, thank thank you for that. Um, we do want to encourage our participants if they have questions to please uh, put them in the Q and A box, and we will get to them. And Josh, do we have any new ones that you wanted to mention? Thank yes, thank you so much. So we do have um, a question about uh, protected bike lanes and access to the curb for users of paratransit. Uh, I'd like to just perhaps a uh, phrase that more generally is, how well are we accommodating people of all users as we rethink our roads, as we think of things like center running bike lanes or bus stops um, that aren't necessarily you know, right where the bus would then go um, and, and working with uh, protected bike lanes that maybe go between the curb and a bus stop. A lot of challenges with very limited room in Massachusetts. So I'm interested in our panelists take on how we resolve those conflicts? So um, I think we have a long way to go. I think we have a long way to go here. I think the number one challenge um, <clears throat> that we have today is that, that we are not doing enough uh, work together to identify solutions. I think that there are still a lot of very distinct, distinct uh, sort of distinctions between groups um, interested in kind of uh, you know their own perspectives and own experiences, whether that's 
as a as a car driver, as a cyclist, as a as a pedestrian, um, and there has not been been enough collaboration. Um, we often are have the experience of re reviewing concepts for bike lanes or floating island bus stops, and um, you know it's very clear that each and every decision is sort of being created from, from scratch and that certainly all the impacted parties are not, are, are rarely at the table together. Um, and municipalities are handling this, each handling it in their own way. Um, and I think in terms of state and federal guidelines, while there are some good ones out there, there's not a lot that looks at the intersections of all of these modes and none of which really zero in on accessibility considerations. So although there's certainly some examples of places where this has been done pretty well, it's not, it's not happening consistently yet. Wow, that's a big challenge and I don't know who should be tasked with trying to bring everyone together. That's that's a really big job, um, but I get get what you're saying. If everybody is like focused on their own interests and their own safety, then we can't really be, as Reggie talks about, inclusive and considering everyone. So it's it's really important. If I um, may, though, I think that the the groups that uh, that often find themselves at loggerheads, the distinctions between them, and sometimes their interests can be artificial. Um, for example, um, uh, the disabled community and the cyclist community. Well, I'm a disabled cyclist. There are also a lot of disabled people I know who use a bicycle, um, just an ordinary bicycle, as their primary mobility aid. Um, and they don't think of themselves as cyclists. Um, they, just, uh, they just find that this is an awful lot more comfortable than other ways of getting around and a lot more convenient and easier to park. Um, also easier to fuel. <laughs> It's, it really is, I think, I think the, the hardest challenge that we've got isn't so much the size of the streets, but our efficiency in use of them. That when we have individuals, uh, you know, one person is taking up all of this room in a metal cage of a car or uh, a truck, sometimes trucks that are commercial sized even, um, that's just a lot less room to move people. And it's a lot more opportunities for accidents with, that can be really quite serious. Um, whenever we can get people using mass transit or uh, being a pedestrian or being a cyclist, then that's just that much more room for everyone to function and cleaner air for us all to breathe. On the, on the issue of safety, we all know it's certainly gotten more dangerous, not just on the interstate highways where the traffic mm -hmm. crashes and fatalities have risen, but just on neighborhood streets where there's a lot of speeding, people are complaining about it, they're concerned about it. So it's if it's bad for the general population, it must be especially challenging for people who have handicaps or disabilities. Can mm -hmm. any of you want to comment about that, Reggie or Laura, about you know, the extra challenge that our current environment is, is exerting on people. I think, so, so with your question, Bob, what comes to mind are micromobility, uh, this micromobility, right? We, 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 uh, there's a lot of conversation about e-scooters and, and, you know, the sharing of ships, the sharing of the shared space. But like any conversation in the redistribution of any sort of resource space in this particular instance, um, there's a whole, there's a bunch of, of, of questions that, even in terms of design that 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 it that surfaces. For for one, uh, we we know that the very nature of, of, of scooters, for example, and I use this because this is what comes to mind, uh, e-scooters, for example. Um, have not been articulated in the sense that it has considered people with disabilities who tra traverse the same space. Uh, 
and uh, might potentially present a, a, a considerable hazard to, to, to people with disabilities. For instance, a person who has a, a severe difficulty in walking. But, but the, other, the other facet that doesn't come into much of the conversation in the, in the use of in micromobility conversations is that the, the question of how were they designed and, and the actionability of design. And by this, I mean, are we looking at micromobility and its ergonomic uh, design as, um, as uh, compatible or acceptable to the needs of people with disabilities. Um, and that goes straight into safety. Where we design micromobility and assume that the user is standing does not really address the safety of the user and the inclusivity of, and, and the inclusion of all sorts of abilities. Um, uh, and, and so, I, you know, I, 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 I sort of I'm very cautious whenever I have conversations around th that space, especially about micromobility, because there's a whole, there's the issue of actionability and location. Um, as, as, as Dylan has pointed out, much of these alternatives, though individualized, and really when we when there's a talk about people with disabilities and having options, it's really sometimes uh, boxed into this category of individualized transportation, right? And while that provides, micromobility provides that, the problem we have is, is location, loca locational uh, and actionable options. Are the locations where these e-bikes are provided um, prevalent in communities where um, uh, you know that are low income, and we know that in lower income, lower income households of 150 percent, uh, you know, uh, disability rates than than you know non poor households. So there's there's that whole gamut of, uh, of um, elements into that conversation, and, and I really don't want <laughs> no further um, elaborate, but. Safety does not only mean physical, but it also has some very locational and actionable uh, elements to it. Okay, and um, Laura, I don't know if you wanted to comment on the whole safety question, which of course is uh, really no, big think, at the MBTA now. Yeah, I think in addition to everything Reggie laid out, I think one thing that we are seeing and hearing a lot from writers is that, well, you know, all of these, all of these options for transportation are ultimately a great thing. Um, and some of the new ways we're approaching providing transportation, even just within the MBTA from our center island, center island bus, like your dedicated bus lanes to, um, you know, center island, Green Line, Green Line stations, um, that, that, uh, oftentimes accessing our services requires stepping out into that shared streetscape. And that for many is a very scary, scary, sometimes dangerous thing. Um, so, you know, whether you're somebody who, um, you know, is blind or has low vision or walks a little bit slower, um, you know, stepping out into a busy intersection is something that that is not not to be taken lightly. So, as we are <clears throat> as we are continuing to kind of try to figure out how to live live um, live alongside again with with all of these other options, really focusing on intersection uh, upgrades and safety and safe crossings. Um, at, in all key locations and all key neighborhoods and all neighborhoods is huge because again, where we we're moving towards a world where, you know, you're not just going to be able to hang out on the sidewalk to get your bus. You're going to have to be able to to get to get across and um, across the street um, periodically. So, so that, that that's you know one thing we're see, we're seeing and hearing a bunch on trying to give some careful thought too. Okay, and uh, I know Sarah, we were talking before about this omnibus bill on Beacon Hill. Yes. Which yeah. addresses a lot of these safety concerns. Tell us what you know about that. 
Um, well, it's um, it's got a wonderfully clear title. It's called an act to reduce traffic fatalities. And um, there's a lot in it. It's an omnibus bill, but some of the, the things in it that I'm really excited about are that um, it would require a three foot passing distance around cyclists, pedestrians, folks in mobility devices, and also around construction works. Um, and the more that we can get distance built in, um, as well as physical barriers, the more protected the people who use all of the various modes are going to be. Um, it also requires uh, new safety features for trucks um, and not uh, wacky new technologies as such, but just side and rear view cameras. Um, I was really shocked to find out that um, in Boston and Cambridge alone, two thirds of the cyclists killed in the last 10 years were hit by someone driving a truck. Um, so as many safety features as we can build in, as much as we can have, uh, have that traffic protected from the rest and the rest protected from that. And whenever we can use uh, a vehicle other than a truck to make a delivery or to move people, um, that's a win for safety. And this bill is now making its way uh, through Beacon Hill. We don't know what it's success will be but you're it, it is in the mists of beacon hill and uh and i hope it will emerge as a beacon from it <laughs> okay uh josh any update on our questions yes here's a, a question are there communities um or states or regions that are we would look at as a model for how to design infrastructure that best balances the uh you know safety with the needs of all users, including people with disabilities, cyclists, pedestrians, transit riders. Mm. Well, the Netherlands is also often pointed <laughs> to as a model. Um, and I've got to say that, uh, that I'm a huge fan. Um, you'll see over there uh, infrastructure in which um, people uh, in wheelchairs are being transported on bicycles that have a platform specifically to curry people in wheelchairs. Um, and uh, just being really intelligent about, uh, about the structure of intersections and so on in ways that, that the, the rest of the panel can speak to, I think, better than I. I don't think that there's one uh, jurisdiction in particular that has like some sort of monopoly of the um, inclusive design in terms of the public space, but there are, um, um, as Dylan has mentioned, um, there's the example of Netherlands, there's an the example of Singapore in terms of its open spaces, mm. um, uh, in, in that it's inclusive and uh, people with various abilities um, are able to enjoy the public spaces. There's examples of South Korea, uh, cities in South Korea that present uh, really um, uh, innovations in public transit and the way that they the, the, uh, the way that they include um, people with disabilities in some of their uh, technologies that they use within the stations. Um, uh, uh, but I would say that the, uh, of these examples, um, the underlying or what is, what is common to all of them is a, is, is a great, greater understanding of who they are serving and who they are designing. I think that uh, and, and there's this there's this uh, small uh, city in South Korea. It's called Daejeon, and and their technologies within which they have included uh, 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 accommodations for uh, people with disabilities as uh, as well as pregnant women are astounding because of their understanding of the demographic that they serve the community that they serve. So I think what underpins all of this is a, a huge uh, consideration in the human experience, explicit and expressed in a particular community. I have a couple of questions that were sent in ahead of time, which might be combined. And they, they both address um, you know, an issue with, we're, we're talking about Boston-centric transportation, basically, but we're, obviously we're a large state and people in rural areas have even more of a challenge of getting transit. So 
Someone asks about subsidized door-to-door on-demand transportation, which some regional transit authorities are providing. And, um, you know, another person asks, growing the reach of the MBTA to connect suburbs, uh, farther out to connect the suburbs. But it seems to me that this brings in the whole regional transit authority uh, structure in terms of what they're doing. Uh, I know of at least two authorities that are trying to develop on demand, not with the big buses, but the small vans, on demand service for people. What if we heard about that? And, and Laura, in terms of Boston, of course, the ride is, is the big service, the paratransit service, which has had its ups and downs and complaints. And so give us, uh, among all of you, some sense of where we're at in, in, in terms of that. So um, starting starting with the ride, I think the ride also has gone, like you said, Bob, through it shares of up and downs over the years. I think one major one major milestone that the ride um, was part of a few years ago was the launching of this very innovative, um, at the time, one of a kind pilot with ride sharing groups like Uber and Lyft. Mm that um, allowed ride users, ride subscribers to essentially shift some of their their, um, trips over to Uber and Lyft at a subsidized rate. Um, And from that, what we saw, not only did this open up options for folks who then were not required to schedule their trip a day in advance, like is required uh, when you use the ride, not only did it open up for folks that uh, were eager to get on a ride sharing platform, it also really motivated both the MBTA and these, these corporations to address the fact that they did not have enough accessible vehicles in their fleets to provide, to provide on-demand service for everyone. And over time, um, due to um, a lot, a lot of reasons, contractual pressure being one of them, they they found ways to integrate uh, accessible vehicles into their fleets. And I think today the T's approach it can serve as a model for a number of other agencies, but also RTAs in terms of of setting expectations around accessible vehicles, because that is one of um, the bigger challenges for a lot of these uh, local communities and RTAs is how do we provide equivalent on-demand service if we just don't have enough accessible vehicles? And there's all sorts of ways to think about incentives and, um, and motivators to getting there. So. I think that's one way the ride will ultimately end up influencing, um, you know, a number of organizations, hopefully for the for the better. I know when you had to book your ride 24 hours in advance, I mean, a lot of us don't know what we'll be doing the next couple of hours. That in itself is a tremendous inconvenience for people. And, and uh, I'm glad to see that, you know, something is being done to address that. So it's your understanding as well that in the rural areas, this is being tried out. Is it, do you happen to know if it's working? Well, so I don't, I don't know to the extent that it's being tried out. I know that this is, you know, sort of identified as, as a challenge and as a, as one of the roadblocks for really, for really being able to uh, implement a successful on-demand program, because one of the, one of the key requirements of that, of running an on-demand program is you have to demonstrate that regardless um, of if somebody is requesting a trip uses a wheelchair or not, you have to be able to to get them in a roughly equivalent time. Um, so I think this is this is something a lot of lot of uh, groups are grappling with right now. It'd be something to investigate and go into and find out what, where we are in that because that to me is a big change in people's lives. Um, and one other question that we didn't get to was, um, although we referenced it, uh, the T's bus stops <laughs> or mm. lack of them, or, or, you know, the difficulty in, in people using them and being protected and, 
Uh, is the MBTA making progress on that front? So we have a lot going on relative to our bus work, bus network right now. This is this is shaping up to be like the decade of the bus at the MBTA. So um, folks may have heard um, the T sort of undertaking this massive proposed redesign of our bus network um, that will fundamentally shift some routes around if if you want to learn more about that, go to our website. Um, and we really want to get riders' feedback on those proposals. But in addition to that network redesign proposal, we are currently uh, working on a couple of big things specific to bus stops. First is um, a number of years ago, we surveyed all 7,600 of our bus stops for um, for accessibility uh, compliance. And we identified the those that were fundamentally inaccessible and have been working to reconstruct them over the past few years. Um, so that, that effort continues and will continue for a couple of years into the future. In addition to that, um, uh, one of our peer departments has been working on a, a program to expand some of the key features that Dylan, you were mentioning earlier about bus shelters and benches and real-time information to make sure that more and more of our bus stops are safe and comfortable places to wait. Um, so later this year, you will start seeing more shelters, more benches, and some real-time kiosks out at a number of stations. Um, and ultimately a lot of that's gonna be funded through advertising revenue um, and hopefully a self-sustaining sustaining program. So we have, we have a, a few big things going on there. Um, one thing I would say related to the, the infrastructure of bus stops that's a little unique in the Boston area is that 99% of our stops are located on sidewalks that are owned and maintained by cities and towns. So we really have been working on our partnerships to get, to get them information about these locations so that through their public work efforts that these locations can be prioritized for updates. Um, like I said, we're rebuilding a few hundred bus stops um, because we recognize those are so critical to our riders, but we really want to we really want to be working together with the cities and towns so that their infrastructure, um, you know, advances as as quickly as possible. Okay, uh, Josh, any other questions uh, on the Q and A? I think we've uh, gotten to just about all that have been asked. A couple of questions, not totally on topic. Um, so I could be, be glad to offer one other sure. question, which is that when we talk about disability rights, are we um, dealing with you know our legacy in Massachusetts, um, or is this a worldwide problem? Is there something unique to this area that makes our challenges more challenging to uh, to overcome? You know, what is our what, what are the biggest hurdles? It's maybe less uh, not a simple question. Hmm. Um, I would say just, I mean, thinking just, just within this country, um, we are not alone. When we talk to our peer peers at other transit agencies who think about issues around access or equity, um, they, they are struggling as well. And in many ways, um, really because of that, that lawsuit and settlement and the culture change that has driven we are ahead of the curve. Although our infrastructure may be still lag lagging behind because we're so old, um, you know, we're we're making more investments and thinking a little bit more progressively. But I think, you know, as Reggie sort of alluded to, I think as a nation, we are not always thinking um, holistically about the individual and about our needs collectively as, as they relate to kind of interacting with, 
with our environment and recognizing that, you know, disability is a normal part of life that needs to be needs to be factored into all sorts of design decisions we make in, in all aspects of our lives. There's one question I had, which kind of goes back to the beginning. Uh, Barbara asks, what is being done for those who have a quote, invisible handicap? Uh, she doesn't specify that, but, but Reggie, maybe you want to sort of tie this up. So there's certainly, um, so I, I guess uh, the question pertains to, you know, apparent, non-apparent, brain-based, sensory disabilities that are not usually, we don't usually just are able to uh, perceive just by looking at the person. But there are, um, you know, examples by which um, they are being addressed, although not also as visible. For instance, you know, uh, people, uh, the issue of glare for people who have low vision, that is also being addressed by some programs uh, that Laura is, is um, spearheading over at the team. Um, issues for folks who have um, difficulty in hearing, while, while they're not um, uh, totally deaf, there's, there's a, a contextual wayfinding measures that's being done by the T that also addresses this. So there are ways in which uh, we are moving, but I want to, I cannot emphasize enough the fact that the ADA provides us with, with the, the basic like structure or the minimum standard. This isn't the maximum standard. Times have changed, lifespans have, you know, have, have lengthened, uh, scientific, you know, uh, innovations have been done to lengthen human life. Obviously, uh, disability as we know it has taken on many forms. And, and with that, you know, uh, our understanding and how to do remediation efforts really should be lifted up and increased uh, in recognition of this development. Listen, I want to thank all of you panelists for being with us tonight. Um, Laura Brelsford from the MBTA, Reggie Ramos, Director of Inclusive Public Transit at the Institute for Human Centered Design, and Sarah Dylan Breuer, co host of Bike Talk on KPF, uh, KPFK radio, we should say. Uh, thanks to all of you. And uh, this is our final program on our mass mobility series. Now the videos will be available on the Forum Network website and YouTube channel. Now you can already rewatch Next Stop, No Ticket to Ride, which is our program on low uh, discounted fares and free fares. That's already there and there will be upcoming uh, programs that you can see there. Now, uh, I wanna especially thank Josh Ostroff who is our great partner, Josh. Do you have some closing remarks to make tonight? Thank you so much, Bob. I'll try to keep this under an hour. <laughs> this has been a great uh, partnership with the WGBH Forum team. Uh, you know, in talking about what people pay to ride public transit, the funding that we need in order to uh, build and operate the system that we need across the state, the issue of how we are reimagining our roads and the ways in which we are elevating uh, human and civil rights to transportation justice to ensure that everybody has the opportunity to travel safely uh, with dignity uh, to get where they need to go. Um, I'm really proud of the team that you've got over there and the panelists that we've been invited on has just been extraordinary in really having more conversations. I think that for transportation to succeed, we need to convene people to share perspectives and ideas to be ensured that we're engaging with people who are actually using the system Policy only happens when it's informed by people and practice, and that we need to ensure that we have you know, thoughtful discussions informing a design, because design is really where uh, it all has to um, happen. Um, of course, it doesn't happen without resources, but no amount of money will compensate for bad design. So uh, Transportation for Massachusetts as a statewide coalition is uh, you know, sincerely trying to do the very best we can to ensure that our agencies are accountable for providing the very best service that our leaders and across the state are providing, you know, the resources needed. Um, and it's also up to people to make smart decisions to accommodate others. You know, none of us exist in a vacuum. Uh, we really need to respect 
the you, the needs of others on the road. As someone once uh, said, you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. So we all are accountable <laughs> for solving this thing. Um, you met the enemy. And he that's right, that's right. So I said I could go on for an hour, but I'm going to uh, cut it off there. But thank everyone for tuning in. I hope people have the opportunity to watch this. Um, in, in, you know, in the weeks and months to come, because I think it's been a great step forward and look forward to more collaboration, Bob, with you. Yes. Uh, you don't get thanked enough, Bob. Thank you for, for your journalism on, on, on this. So it's really appreciated. Well, this is just a great opportunity afforded us by the, the GBH Forum Network, the great people behind it. And, uh, you know, we all know, those of us who, who are in the world of transportation, how important it is because it literally does affect every single person. So these decisions are really important and we're in a very dramatic time uh, right now in terms of transformation, in terms of technology, transportation, and just politics in general. How is it going to happen and you know who's going to make it happen? Okay, thanks a lot, everybody.